tonight for the first time? Anybody? Oh, wonderful. Terrific. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Um, the Center for Fiction supports storytelling in all its forms, and we offer a vibrant home for readers and writers. Please, all of you, get involved, come have coffee, write in the space, and join us for other events produced here on this stage. Tonight is a special night and an exciting night. We're here to do two things. We'll introduce you to the newly selected Susan Camel Emerging Writer Fellows and hear a final reading from our amazing 22-23 cohort. As we welcome our new cohort of fellows, they join a community that has grown over the years and includes some of the leading voices in the literary world. Gina Chung, Kim Coleman Foote, Mitchell S. Jackson, just to take a moment to celebrate some former fellows with recent pub dates. Tonight is one of the best examples of how we do our work. It's a signature moment. And of course, we couldn't do this without our board of directors and supporters. In particular, I want to give a lot of uh, gratitude to the initial contributors to the Susan Camel Award for Emerging Writers, including Penguin Random House, Macmillan, Maria Campbell, Kathy Robbins, Stuart Applebaum, Bob Cohn, Barney Carpfinger, Julie Bearer, Joni Evans, Ginny Weatherell, and Salman Rushdie. And a huge thanks to the annual supporters of this program, including the Jerome Foundation, Amazon Literary Partnership, and Penguin Random House. If you're interested in learning more about supporting this program, please talk to me tonight or anytime. And I'd now like to introduce to the stage Randy Winston, the Center for Fiction's Director of Writing Programs. Welcome, Randy. Greetings and salutations. How y'all doing? Oh, there we go, there we go. Um, I'm Randy Winston, Director of Writing Programs here at the Center for Fiction. Before we get started, I wanna thank a few people for their support. Uh, Matt Kafori, Celeste Kaufman, our events team, Melanie McNair, Eliana Cohen North, our events interns, uh, Joey Southers, our bookstore manager and our bookstore staff, Scott Williamson Jr., our cafe and bar manager and our cafe and bar staff, and all of my colleagues upstairs, Christian Henley, and of course, Lida DeBen, our new executive director here at the center. This is a culmination of a lot of effort that we've put, a, put in over the past year, so thank you all for your support. So, um, welcome to the second installment of two readings for our 2022-2023 Susan Camel, Emerging Writer Fellows, the final reading, unfortunately. Um, the Center for Fiction is a home for readers and writers, storytellers of all forms, and in that home, I oversee several wings. It's a big estate, if you will, and in that estate is the Susan Camel Emerging Writer Fellowship. This fellowship is entering its 13th year that's nine fellows annually, over 100 writers impacted by this program. The selected nine New York-based writers are awarded $5,000 and granted access to all the center's resources, including our library, which celebrated its 200th year in 2021, writing workshops, public events, discounts in our bookstore, voice and performance instruction by the great Sarah Montague, we're Sarah. Hey, Sarah. And, and a place to write in our writer studio. We also give our fellows access to our network. They are paired with editors in the industry, a mentorship model, and meet publishing professionals such as agents, senior editors, authors, VPs, and publishers in an intimate setting via our monthly dinner series. This year, we received over 750 applications for the 23-24 fellowship cohort, which we narrowed down to 45 and now nine recipients. With that, I'd like to introduce you to our 2023-2024 Susan Camel Emerging Writer Fellows. Please join me here on stage 
when your name is called. Caprice Gray, who is not here tonight. Gen yeah. Genesis Villar. Henry Chapman. Israel Daramola. Monique Laban. Nicole Ju. Niv Shaker. Vida James, who is not here. And Virginia Marshall. Um, this, this is going to be a great year, I, I swear, I promise. Um, my job is to shepherd you through this program, more importantly, to equip you with the knowledge and tools needed to navigate this industry. My hope is that this work continues well after your fellowship cycle ends, uh, that you continue to grow in the work that you do for yourself, uh, for your community, and for each other. That is the work. I look forward to the year ahead. Congratulations. Um, excitement is in the air. Humidity has dissipated. The lantern flies aren't coming around as much. <laughs> fall and winter, my, my favorite seasons. The start to fall has not disappointed at all. You all get to hear from these talented writers. Our Jasmine Ward, Ta-Nehisi Coates event is on, uh, tickets are on sale for that October 24th. Please take a ticket, take two, take three. Bless somebody tonight. Our annual benefit tickets are also available on our website. Um, we can also put away those window air conditioning units. <clears throat> Unless you have the media U-shape machine, you could just sit those on the bracket and raise your window up properly. Genius design, folks. Um, the rules for tonight's reading. Uh, each reader will read for two to three minutes max. That's nine readers, three minutes each. My job is to get you in and out seven, eight, one hour. I actually, I actually don't know why I'm rushing y'all. I don't know what people do on Thursday night. So <laughs> the most important thing is that you all don't waste your beer or your alcohol while you're clapping. So protect that at all costs. Lastly, and most importantly, folks, I asked our fellows for a favor, did I not? Uh, during the cohort year, we've talked about many things, craft, agents, revising and editing, and more importantly, Zodiac signs. M music, TV, film, Taco Bell, we did. And as I prepare for the change in seasons and my annual watch Home Alone 1, the original during the holidays, I couldn't help but think about all the pizza on that table when Kevin and Buzz got to fighting and how many takes it took and how much pizza all those actors were eating. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I would love to cameo in that, in that movie just for that one moment. So tonight, our fellows were kind enough to share with me their Broadway show, film, or TV series that they would love to cameo in. You will hear about those cameos tonight during their intros. Let's get started. Our first reader of the night, is Jiaming Tang, who also goes by Andy. The show Andy would love to cameo on is MTV's Catfish. <laughs> and Andy, Andy will be reading from Cinema Love, his novel forthcoming from Dutton Books in May 2024. How about that? Now, Andy could not be here tonight, so Andy recorded his reading, which you will hear now. Hello, this is Xiaoming. You can call me Andy. 
and thank you guys for coming out tonight. Um, I'm sorry I can't be there and thus forcing you all to experience me and my face like this. Um, but in any case, thank you to the center and to my fellow fellows and especially to Randy for um, this past year of support. Um, I'm going to be reading from my debut novel, Cinema Love. Um, the book is right here. It's a gallery. Uh, and it's forthcoming from Dutton Books in May of 2024. Um, and to give you guys the, the, the briefest of synopses, it's a novel about gay men in rural China and the woman who married them. And I will be reading from the first page. There he is, hiding in the basement and waiting for love. Upstairs is a cinema. The movies on rotation are old, and to outsiders, it's a wonder there's any business at all. They joke about the place over cheap beer. Money laundering is a popular theory. So is human trafficking, except that the people who frequent the theater are small, nervous men. The only woman anyone has seen here is the box office clerk. You know, the stern one who limps. She's here now, shuffling from hallway to box office with a dustpan and a broom. A customer waits outside, his hat pulled low. The exchange is wordless. The woman's eyes lick like a tongue while the customer gestures with his finger. One ticket, I don't care for what, before a larger than normal bill moves from hand to outstretched hand. Woman and customer exchange nods, and the latter enters with the gait of a bandit. The customer knows the cinema like the lines on the lover's face. There are two wings, each with a screening room, a toilet, and in the left wing, a staircase disguised as a closet door. These stairs lead to a basement where the customer walks down the dark hall. Past graffiti, past cigarette butts, over torn up movie tickets, and into a cloud of smoke. There aren't any strobe lights down here, but he imagines that there are. No music either, or alcohol. Just a lone mattress on the floor. A light bulb with a hanging chain. And sometimes, like now, a man waiting for love. Are you? The man asks. Yes, the customer says with his eyes. Ah. There's no more communication between them, only a slow movement forward, thumping heartbeats in surprise. I can't believe this is going to happen, the customer thinks. I can't believe I'm about to. Afterwards, shuddering, the groans of an ancient mattress. Thank you, and uh, congrats to the new fellows. Our next reader is Han Chang. The film Han would cameo in is Fallen Angels. Specifically, he wants to be part of the kidnapped family in the ice cream truck. Um, he'll be reading from his story, Lend Us Your Grace. Han, will you read for us, please? Thank you uh, to my fellow fellows, thank you to Randy, and thank you to the Center for Fiction. Uh, this year's been great. I'm going to be reading the beginning from my story called Lend Us Your Grace. For a little bit, a long time ago, we lived down the hall from Mrs. Lincoln Town Car. This was before Mrs. Lincoln Town Car got pulled down somewhere horrible and darker, an event which further spurred me and Mama and Bubba on our furious climb somewhere out into that brightness. She was my one adult friend. She said fuck and fucking and motherfucker a lot and called me her little Thai friend. And even though I never liked being called little, and even though we were really Taiwanese as far back as time, I'd nevertheless feel all warm and jacked up whenever she called me that, like I'd been let into some second hearth. Mrs. Lincoln Town Car is not the point of the story, but I did like her because she gave me a pack of peanut M&Ms whenever I stopped by, which was the sort of treat that Mama would meet out over the course of many undemarcated mornings and afternoons, a reward for sitting at home totally still and crisscross applesauce while she left on some errand, a directive 
which I always took extremely seriously, as though, had I let my attention waver for even a second, she would have gotten hurt in some severe and or combustive way. And she was always saying how without insurance, that would have been our super inglorious end. Anyway, back then we lived, back then we were living in an apartment complex called the Preserve, or maybe Willowbrook, or some other fancy name inscribed on a shoddy sign by the freeway under the long reigning tyranny of Mama's grand $10 a day plan, a policy which came with a rotation of roommates, i.e. random surplus adults, like the old man who never left his room or the newly immigrated Taiwanese bachelor who drove taxis and dreamt of running his own black car service, talking about killing himself like it was his back pocket salvation. Me and Mama and Bubba had the larger room, which we furnished with a one six inch mattress pad and three stacks of FedEx boxes, which stored everything from sweatpants to important government documents to a scratched up Tchaikovsky's greatest hits cassette, which Bubba listened to regularly, but reverently. The room had this bad habit of getting too hot in the summers, so we'd have to space out with Mama at the far edge of the bed and Bubba at the very other edge and me lying supine dead center in the middle, occasionally lifting my head up to breathe because the thick, humid microclimate would nevertheless form between their sweaty backs. A fresh air relief that was quickly punctuated by a fear, the kind of horizonless fear only a child can have from leaving that kind of embryonic warmth. Out the room, down the four feet hall, in our dining, living, everything room, there was an itchy futon where me and Mama sat whenever we weren't on our long going nowhere walks. We'd split a, yo we split a blueberry yo plate, scratch each other's arms, and try to decipher this vast, invariably confusing country through the keyhole of WGN Evening News and ABC Eyewitness and Zabumafu and that weird clock clown lady who seemed to tick, tick, tick with her arms and legs spread as though she were the very passage of time. We take turns trying to interpret the neon on black captions which flitted by too fast to be useful. Mama asking, hey, wake up, what did he say? Is that a crayon factory? Was that a celebration or a funeral? And above the futon, Bubba had taped up a collage of loose papers. One, a map of the greater Chicagoland area with random circles and X's marking his pending and failed interviews. Two, a creased American flag that ostensibly covered up the Australia-shaped burn mark, but also signaled our unwavering, if ulterior motive, patriotism. And three, overlapping clippings of Lego Bionicle canisters from the Toys R Us weekly ads. The clippings furthest back faded the most because the newspaper ink wasn't really designed for long-term open-air yearning, of being subjected to that superlative light that came in through the curtainless patio doors a light that came far flung over antennaless Dodge neons and a murky green pond strewn with crumpled Pepsi cans. A pond which at the time, all those years back, seemed to possess an almost ethereal quality, the silken sheen that parted into angled draft lines when the ducks glided about aimlessly as me and Mama chucked motes of Wonder Bread with a highborn flare. We spent a lot of afternoons like that. The Wonder Bread was the rare overspending she allowed, I think, because of how unduly lavish it made us feel, that for $1.99, we could vault ourselves so far beyond where we could see into some free spending philanthropic class that we so badly wanted to be a part of but were too embarrassed to say out loud. Lending us a kind of provisional grace, widened by our wanting, which enlarged the rest of those days. Thank you. Uh, good luck, incoming fellows. Our next reader is Diana Cole. <laughs> Diana will carry cameo in 30 Rock as a contestant on the game show, Homonym. <laughs> she will be reading from Obit, her novel in progress. Diana, will you read for us, please? Thank you, Randy, um, and congratulations to all the new fellows. You guys are in for a really wonderful year. Okay. I excused myself so I could be alone. Anna and I were halfway through a terrible poetry reading at an art center in Red Hook. When I stood to push past her seat, she flashed her eyes at me, but she let me go. Out in the damp, pebbled courtyard, I lit a cigarette and at once felt the tension in my shoulders evaporate. 
Anna was trying to get me to quit smoking, which only increased its appeal. I finished the cup of wine I'd brought out with me. Then I held my cigarette between my teeth so I could dig in my tote for my Poland spring bottle. From the penumbra beneath a stunted tree, a guy appeared. Can I bum one of those? He asked. I felt a tug of resentment and then nearly simultaneous shame. Normal people shared things without complaint. I handed him the pack. Cool, he said. Retro. They were parliaments. He held the pack at arm's length and squinted like he had reading glasses on. An old person's gesture. It was kind of cute. I thought of seeing beggars can't be choosers and instead just shrugged. He tried to catch my eye, but I wouldn't let him. Then he nodded and fished a yellow lighter from his jeans pocket. A relief. He wasn't a fake smoker. He kept standing there for a moment after he'd lit it and handed back the pack. Peripherally, I could see he had remarkable cheekbones, and long hair cheaply dyed a darker shade of brown. I hoped he wasn't going to try to talk to me. I arranged my shoulders so as to communicate this wish. Actually, he said, if it's not too weird, I'd love some of your water. My throat's dry and I'm going up in a moment. I'd been gulping. I lowered the bottle and screwed the cap back on. That's personal, I said. He put his hands together in a prayer gesture, obnoxious, and stepped back. Understood. Thanks for the cigarette. See you in there. Hope not, I thought, and nodded. He was gone. I ended up staying outside and drinking for a while, staring at how the wet pebbles gave off little parentheses of reflected light. It was October, but the night was warm despite the rain. I was sweating inside my jacket. Others from the audience, weirdly numerous, came outside in clusters. I moved out from under the awning and sat on a damp bench to avoid them. By the time I returned, the last reader was stepping off stage to inconsistent applause. Where were you? Anna said. Your hair's all wet. She had the line between her eyebrows that meant she was mad. I explained that it had started raining again, and she frowned like I had done this myself on purpose. Sorry I left you, I said. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I kissed her temple, but with my mouth closed so she couldn't smell my breath. Anna seemed partially appeased. She told me I'd missed some amusing poets. One guy had read a bunch of documents from the Senate Intelligence Committee's report on CIA torture sites. He read the redacted parts, too, by remaining silent for an equivalent number of beats. So he was just standing there saying nothing for a really long time. And another guy had read the AI transcripts of several voicemails from an ex. I sided with her immediately, of course, Anna said. This guy looked like an asshole. Anna thought every guy looked like an asshole. She was usually right. I found myself wondering if she was talking about the guy who'd bummed a cigarette from me. Hadn't he said he was going up? Now that the reading was over, I wanted to go to a bar. Anna said no, it was time to go home. So that was what we did. Thank you. Our next reader is J.P. Infante. J.P. would like to make a cameo in the original Home Alone as well, except he wants to help the con men catch Macaulay Culkin. All right, brother. (laughs) He'll be reading an entitled novel in progress. The excerpt is about an argument between two factory workers a second-generation Dominican-American, and an immigrant Dominican in a van after a day's work. JP, the stage is yours. What's up, y'all? Good evening. Buenas noches. Here we are. Um, Welcome to the New Fellows. Um, This is going to be a really dope experience. Shout out to... um, What's his name again? Well, what's his name? The dude who was it? Rand, Randy Winston. Just um, um, what he's doing for the program, I think it's super easy to send emails, organize, e- you know, like it seems like the role is really straightforward and easy. However, I think what Danny, what Danny, what's your name? Randy. What, what Randy does and what, what Randy's done for us is it's beyond that. Like he's actually a human being, right? Um, whether it be answering emails, texts, um, he's gone above and beyond. And I just want to give you your flowers, bro, because so shout out to Randy. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's a, that's about half of my time right there. And a shout a shout out to um my the fellows in my cohort. Um y'all y'all fucking amazing and it's dope meeting y'all, experiencing this with y'all. And I'll start. I thought I'd work at the factory and organize these workers, but it's impossible to make one out of many. Dario, Arcadio, Maria, Paula, Jose Juan, Stan, a man called Carlos, I think, who looks like Julio Cortazar, but without the beard, with far apart almond eyes and one eyebrow. Ephraim, who looks like a light brown James Baldwin with the same big frog eyes. There's a woman who sits in the back of the van, I can't remember her name, who looks like Paula. Both of them look like Zora Neale Hurston if you look at them long enough. There's this huge woman with red hair who looks like Sandra Cisneros with thin lips, thin eyebrows, and a nose that's not as wide but a little thinner and pointier. I can't remember her name or any of the others' names. I want to tell them who they remind me of, but can't because they won't understand me the same way my grandmother will die misunderstanding me thinking I'm privileged. And then there's Arturo. Arturo the brute who showed up today back from vacation and is now sitting where I've been sitting because it's supposedly his seat. He looks like Patrick Chamuzo, looking like some writer I could only understand in translation. And even then, he'll probably remind me I'm missing out on some nuance. Jose Juan asked the van in Spanish. It's always in Spanish in this fucking van. What's Cuba's national anthem? Everyone looks at each other, smiling. Arturo doesn't smile because he's an asshole, and everyone is distracting him with questions about his trip to Santo Domingo. The gringo might know this one. Jose Juan winks at me as if I'm a gringo. Someone shouts an answer. There's laughter. Dario says something about Celia Cruz. There's more laughter, but I don't get it. Jose Juan says, have any of you heard that American children's song? I don't know it in Spanish. Cuba's national anthem goes, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. The lyrics are in English, but everyone laughs. I don't understand the laughter. None of them have ever read a worthwhile novel in their life. I tried talking to them about authors from the boom era, but nothing. I asked Maria if she knew who Gabriel Garcia Marquez is, and she replied, Gabo? The poor woman doesn't know. Jose Juan asks, why do Mexicans eat tortillas at Christmas? Why, asked Dario, glancing at the rear view mirror. To have something to wrap, some chuckle. I have a joke, I say to the van. Why do white Americans have the highest life expectancy rate? No one says anything. Because their armies kill the most people, I say. No one laughs because jokes are only funny if they're true, not fact. Some folks move out of the way and I see Stan's face and he says, that's rude, Greg. There's a gap where two teeth should be. Oh shit, I realized I said the punchline in English. Everyone thought I was talking to Stan because he's the only one I speak English with. This is a vulgar joke, interrupts Arturo in Spanish. Paula, cover your ears. The van returns to the Spanish realm and it's like the air inside changes. Everyone knows you see white women's breasts in Playboy magazine. Does anyone know where black women's breasts are shown? Asks Arturo with a grin, stretching his tree trunk of a neck. Arturo delivers the punchline. You see black women's breasts in National Geographic. Dario chuckles. Paula closes her Bible, sucks her teeth, and mumbles something I can't hear. Some in the van do not laugh. Some criticize Arturo and use words like perverso and ofensivo. Stan is looking out the window. Jose Juan laughs, Dario laughs, but quickly stops and says, te pasate. I shout, that's racist. What? Says Arturo, looking at me and then turning around and looking at everyone else in the van. Yeah, I say, it's racist. That joke is for racists. Hombre, take it easy. The joke is just a joke, says Dario, one hand on the steering wheel while the other swerves with each word. You don't know what a racist is, Blanquito, says Arturo. The boys read a book and think they know the world. I'm not white, I say. 
Everyone in the van laughs, but I wasn't joking. I'm not white. Someone in the back of the van says, he's not even Havao, and they sound Boricua. I want to tell them, if they're going to use these antiquated racist terms, then call me mulatto. I don't know what Habao means, but I know it's on the race chart. They think I'm white, and it's like they've all been organized by Arturo, how they laugh together. They're all rallying around the idea that I'm white. He's organized the workers against me, a worker. Race is a social construct, and I might be light-skinned, but I identify as black. There's more laughter and chatter. I'm translating and transcribing this and talking and being at the same time, so I'm not as accurate in my writing or my being. What do you know about construction work? Ask Arturo. The van erupts in more laughter and translated construct into construcción. And now Arturo is talking about skinny arms and construction workers and a new wave of laughter fills the van. I identify as Chinese, adds Arturo while showing what looks to be an ID card. He emphasized each syllable. Identifico chino. You're a brute, I say. In Spanish, of course, which is closer to ignorant in English, when, but when said in Spanish, unlike ignorante, which doesn't hit like bruto. I'm a brute, says Arturo, and yet here we are working at the same factory. This is research for me. I'm a writer. You hear this kid? He calls himself a writer. A writer is just an excuse for being lazy. The van is laughing at me in unison. Arturo the caveman factory worker has brought them together. This fucking illegal has made one out of many. Thank you. Our next reader is Juliana Roth. If Juliana were to cameo in any movie, she'd deliver a surreal monologue on dreams and Richard Linklater's waking life. She'll be reading from a new short story called Family Farm. Juliana Roth. I feel like I jinxed myself when I said that because now I haven't remembered my dreams for a few days. <laughs> So I want to take it back. Um, but thank you all for being here. Thank you, Randy. Everyone's expressed just how amazing he's been and the center's been. So I'm very grateful to share this night with everyone. Um, all I really have to say about this piece is when I was six years old, I asked my family where chicken came from, and they told me, and I never ate it again, any meat. And that's kind of a lot of what you need to know about me as a writer, too. <laughs> um, like many violent practices in America, I just wish eating animals could disappear overnight. Um, but I know it's more complicated than that. So this excerpt is from a story that imagines a world in which animal agriculture has been outlawed and the corrupt surveillance that emerges to keep people in check. While he questioned me down by his car, I tried to remember him naked so I'd feel less nervous, but my eyes kept going to his hairy thumb, steadying the pen as he wrote. He was dangerous. How had I forgotten? The cows are not meant for consumption, is that right? Because Article 10 prohibits cows being raised for consumption. Oh, they've been raised. We, we got them raised. Still can't be for consumption. That's abuse. We love those cows very much. They're like family to us. You eat your family. Not in so many words, I laughed. His eyes locked on me. Isn't that the cycle of life, though? We die and continue on in some way, reborn countless times over our lives, etc., etc. Guess for some that is how life is. He kept writing as he spoke. I tried smiling at him. You an artist or something, he asked. Me? No. Talk like one. My sister's an artist. She's always on about rebirth. Not an artist, just run this place. And what is this place? A family farm. And what exactly is it that you do here? He asked, looking up from his notepad. Grow things, live off the land, make a nice life for ourselves and those around us. Well, you need a permit for these cows, and they can't be consumed, not in any way. 
I'm not just talking hamburgers, no cheese, no milk, not even cream for your coffee. Article 10, Article 10. We know, I, I haven't had a chance to go down to register them since we've only had them a few weeks and I don't drive, so I can take you down, he said, nodding to the car, still on idle, like he wanted to be sure I knew he wasn't planning on going back inside either. Not today. Nobody will know where I went to if I leave today. They won't be back in for a few hours, and it takes me more than that just to go out and find them. He clicked the top of his pen a few times, watching me. We've got 60 acres. Tell them tonight, and I'll come for you tomorrow, he said as he turned for his car and drove away. I stood out in the yard for a while after he left, kneeling down to pick out the hawkweed coming up. Tiny yellow petals on the flowers uneven at the ends like the brush mark of a painter. I crushed the buds in my palm as I walked back to the kitchen, deciding I'd make a tea. I dressed well and waited for him out by the road starting at seven. I couldn't be sure when he would come. I carried a large thermos of chicory and pulled sips from the tiny silver mug that screwed on top. I felt so abundant there under the sun with the woody liquid rolling around in my mouth. There are some things there's no substitute for. Taste is one of them. Thank you. Our next reader is Sarah Abulafia. Uh, folks, when Sarah was a child, she had a huge crush on Kristen Bell. In the role of newspaper boy and union organizer in the seminal Disney movie musical Newsies. <laughs> she still harbors a secret desire to infiltrate his organization as the only female Newsie. This is partly so that she can help fight the corporate oligarchy, but also so she could be surrounded by Kristen Bell. And a gaggle of or adorable boys who fight for their rights using the world's most popular weapon, dance. Uh, <laughs> she'll be reading. <laughs> she'll be reading from her story, talking with Lilith. Sarah, will you read for us, please? Hi. First, I just want to say thank you to the center and to Randy and to all these gorgeous fellows. Um, you're all the real deal, just a reminder. And um, to the new fellows, you're in for a real treat, so welcome. Cool, I'm just gonna lower it a little bit. Y'all are tall, okay. Thursday night, Mia finds herself in a dive bar in Bushwick. She's on a first date with a sentient jean jacket. He's been rhapsodizing about Wes Anderson and the cinematic virtue of detachment. Mia makes her eyes go Bambi wide, and then she says something true. I like looking at pretty things, too. She excuses herself to the bathroom. She pees a long, slow, French New Wave pee <laughs> and inspects the messages drawn on the wall. Precious, youthful scrawl. Secrets, love letters, fuck yous. She feels a quiet maternal pulse. There is something tender about this filthy space of communion, this bathroom parchment. She wipes. Above the toilet paper roll, Mia reads a message in red Sharpie. For a good time, text a demon. Underneath, there is a signature, Lilith and a phone number. Well, fuck me, Mia thinks. I do need a good time. Some say it was Lilith, not Eve, who was the first woman. The story starts like this. One night, Lilith told Adam that she'd like to be on top, sexually, once in a while. <laughs> Adam was repulsed. They bickered, and the erotic heat of the garden turned cold. Adam slammed the bamboo door and marched to the creator of the universe to complain about his wife. God took pity on Adam and exiled Lilith from Eden. 
In a sense, God and man were gatekeeping a position, top. But it was woman, it was woman who was punished for creating political friction. Lilith became an outlaw, roaming the vague air beyond the garden. Her skin kissed the wind, and the wind kissed back. After several days, God sent a gang of angels to blackmail her. You may return to Eden on a condition that you submit entirely to Adam. Disagree with these terms, and not only will you remain banished from Eden, but the big man will make sure that a hundred of your babies will die every day. Hmm said Lilith. Why would I return to Utopia only to be exiled from myself? There's so much room for me out here. No. Tell God and Adam to leave me alone, whatever the consequences. Well, God's ego, the original ego, was so offended that in addition to killing her children, he made Lilith infertile. Rude. Back in paradise, Adam created a new model of wife for one of his biggest bones. He was trying to distract himself from the offensive thought that he might have climaxed with Lilith looking down on him. But Adam wasn't free of Lilith, for she took revenge by seducing his sons and grandsons and then stealing their semen under cover of darkness. <laughs> Lilith, a barren, owl-faced, demon top, a cum burglar, <laughs> fucked her way around a hazy parallel wavelength. She is said by men to have sharpened her claws and begun to kill. Hi, Lilith, Mia texts from her bed. Found your message at Speedy's. I like that you wrote text instead of call because I have phone anxiety. The next night, Mia is scrolling her phone in the bath when she gets a reply. Hi, it's Lilith, the demon. Thank you for your acknowledgement. I always try to meet people where they are. The full moon is tomorrow, and I have a ritual for you. Go find a heavy rock, put it in your pocket, and let it weigh you down. Do not take it out until I tell you to. Got it? Mia types, yes, and st sinks her head underwater like a stone. She pops up with a grin. Her skin singes with the allure of a game she doesn't yet understand. Thank you. Our next reader is Natalie Adler. Natalie would like to be an extra in Mamma Mia so she can go to the legendary cast party, dance to Voulez Vous with Meryl Streep, and knock back Uzo shots with Christine Baranski. Hollywood studios need to give sag after everything they want so Mamma Mia 3, here we go again, can get into production. If they need a writer, Natalie has ideas. <laughs> Call her agent. Uh, she'll be reading an excerpt from her novel, The Material World. Natalie, will you read for us, please? All right. This has been such a good year, and you are all in for such a treat. I love you, my, my fellow fellows. Randy, thank you for everything. Center for Fiction, you're not going to get rid of us now because we live here. This is our house. Okay, so my novel is about a woman in the 80s who can see ghosts, and she's just learned about exterminators who want to get rid of the ghosts. I saw their ads a lot more after that. Some of them just had the cartoon ghost and the slogan, but a few of them were all text. Feeling unsettled? 
Are you uncomfortable in your own home? You may have ghosts. Weird drafts? Creaks? Water runs cold, flickering lights? Spots on the ceiling? Voices from other rooms? Crossed phone lines, leaky faucet, waking up in a cold sweat at 3 a.m. We can help. Call us any time, day or night. The one I saw had all the numbers ripped off but one. I guess it didn't take much to convince the Brooks and the Sloans and the Susans that their landlord's negligence was actually a problem that could, that had to be dealt with immediately simply by making a call and demanding a service. But it still seemed like a stretch that everyone moving into the neighborhood was ready to believe that someone leaving the TV on next door was a supernatural issue. The ghost on the flyer had empty eyes and its mouth was an O of surprise. It looked nothing like a real ghost, obviously, but how would you draw one when you'd have to know how to see two places at once. It made sense that someone along the line, some Victorian inevitably, had decided that a white sheet with holes for eyes could drape over something that had no form but still took up space. It was the easiest way to sketch a contradiction. But I wasn't an art critic. What bothered me was that there was something mean behind the cartoon. You shouldn't be able to scare a ghost. When I see a ghost, I see them because they're really there. Not here exactly, but there. That place that isn't the opposite of here and now, but is just, I don't know, off. Over there. There's no straightforward way to explain it. I got used to noticing them until, before I knew it, I was shooting the breeze with Mrs. Velez, who lived and died in the apartment underneath ours. She was always telling me about her oldest daughter, the nurse practitioner, who I never saw come to visit, but Mrs. Velez showed me her pictures. And after she died, she still wanted to tell me the same stories. I didn't mind. I had time to listen. I would tell Mark, oh, Mrs. Velez told me the story about her daughter delivering twins outside Bellevue while she was on a cigarette break again. So he didn't realize for weeks that Mrs. Velez had died. It's clear that whatever happens between you and the ghost is real, but not to anyone around you. It's not like the movies or anything. No one is going to walk through Mrs. Velez while she's telling me about how to clean the floors with vinegar. But to talk to her requires the understanding that the conversation is happening in your mind's eye as much as it is right in front of you. Not in a daydreamy sort of way, just that it requires more imagination than spacing out. I do think I have some kind of a talent, and it probably runs in the family. It's not like Ruthie ever sat me down and said, Renata, honey, those things you see out of the corner of your eyes, they're just ghosts. And they're just around, and they won't bother you. But if I did have a mother like Ruthie, but if I didn't have a mother like Ruthie who taught me it was important not to meet everything new with fear, I might have wanted to shut it off. I do think that she doesn't show up to protect me, but in her own way, the way she did when I was little, and she let me run around on my own as if her love was enough to keep me safe. Wherever we lived, people came and went, and I was used to that. I liked the company. But she also told me that if anyone bothered me, I could tell them no. Thank you. We have two readers remaining. Our next reader is Sabrina Helen Lee. If if Sabrina could cameo in any TV show, it would be Avatar The Last Airbender. She has always not so secretly wanted to be a waterbender and help defeat the Fire Nation. All right now. She'll be reading from her novella In Progress. Sabrina Helen Lee, will you read for us please? Thank you to the center and to Randy and to the fellows for making this past year so special. 
During their usual nightly phone call, Mrs. Ko asked if Mrs. Huang would take Mateo to the beach. It's his favorite thing to do, Mrs. Ko said. We took him there for his birthday last fall. Why a beach in the fall, Mrs. Huang asked. Pardon? Why make a child learn to love something in the wrong season? You've never had children, correct? Well, I was your teacher. That's not at all the same. You've never been a mother, correct? Correct, Mrs. Huang said. It was true that Mrs. Huang had never been a mother herself. She had had several opportunities, but had never taken them. She was certain, though, that she knew Mateo better than Mrs. Ko did. She decided this was not the time to tell Mrs. Ko this. She did, after all, want the mother to return home. Nobody had been in touch with her except Mrs. Huang. Two weeks ago, Mrs. Ko had disappeared without a trace. Mrs. Huang knew that her former student didn't want to be found. So Mrs. Huang and Mrs. Ko commenced their small but deliberate talk. Mrs. Huang updated Mrs. Ko on the state of her garden, on her husband's whereabouts, and any mistake another mother had already managed to commit that day. How Layla's mother had forgotten to pick her daughter up from school, how Stacy's mother had a clear favorite child that rotated by the week, how Owen's mother refused to listen to the advice the other mothers gave and was now endangering her children through low-grade radiation exposure, or how Andrew's mother, in a fit of rage, had handed the garbage man her son's favorite toy and then spent the next nine hours driving from landfill to landfill, searching for that horrible bear before returning home and silently slipping into her bedroom before her son could see her. As Mrs. Huang talked, she knew that if one day she were to become a mother herself, she would never make the mistakes these other mothers foolishly fell into, especially those of Mrs. Ko. On the other end of the line, there was a low humming. Mrs. Ko often hummed whenever she believed Mrs. Huang's story had ended or should have ended. So Mrs. Huang ended the story and continued on to the next. As she did during all their calls, Mrs. Huang offered the mother a small note about her son. Whenever we drive anywhere, no matter how long, Mateo lets, never lets himself fall asleep, Mrs. Huang said. He doesn't want it to feel like I'm alone. There was a long and loud humming. Mrs. Huang jumped a little, pulling the phone back from her ear. She had forgotten if there was more to the story or not. But regardless, Mrs. Huang tried to abide by Mrs. Ko's wishes and ended the story there. But the beach, though. There was something more about the beach she had to know. Why a beach in the fall? You already asked me this. It's late. I'd like to go. Why is it his favorite thing to do? It was silent. Mrs. Huang waited and counted the seconds. She wondered if Mrs. Ko had hung up. We let Mateo cut school and drove him to a beach two towns away. He doesn't know how to swim, and he doesn't want anyone who matters to see him learn. He even made me turn around. I tried to explain to Mateo that the water is dangerous and he could get hurt, but he walked up, and with a strength I didn't know he had, he pushed against my legs and turned me around himself. And it was his birthday, and I wanted him to be pleased. So I stayed, turned around, and listened as hard as I could, because if he needed me, I would run. I would always run. But we stayed there for three hours, and I heard nothing. In the end, Mateo tugged on my sleeve and said it was time to go home. He didn't look upset at all. In fact, he looked calmer and newer somehow, as if he had gone back in time, stayed where he was, and traveled long and far away. I never asked him where he went, but as we walked back to the car, I couldn't help but wish that if he had gone somewhere, he could have taken me too. He went back in time? I don't know. It's just a guess. You should take him to a pool next time. Pardon? Pools are safer. Fewer chances of time travel at a pool. Perhaps. She didn't care to admit it aloud, but Mrs. Huang couldn't help but take great pride in how gracefully she was replacing Mrs. Ko in her son's life. We'll go to the beach, Mrs. Huang said, staring at the door. Mrs. Ko hummed and ended the call. Thanks. Our final reader of the night is Emmanuel Lachaud. If Emmanuel were to have a cameo in anything, it would be as a stormtrooper, gladly combing the desert in space balls. He does love a meaningless task. <laughs> He'll be reading from An Empire Called Black, his composite novel in progress. Emmanuel, will you read for us, please? You know, at this point, I don't feel like I need to reiterate just how amazing this program was, right? Anyone who's ever tried writing, you know that there's more than ups and downs. 
but this was 100% a positive. And meeting y'all, Randy, the center of fiction as a whole and the community that actually is developed here wasn't like any other experience she could possibly really have. So for those new fellows, you're gonna be really happy, right? The Mashond is from uh, my composite novel, In Progress, set in the 19th century, an empire called Black. Where the slave revolution that inaugurated the Haitian Revolution of 1791 spread beyond the confines of the Caribbean island. In these stories, we follow the march of that precious word, freedom, and the way it transformed the lives of individuals from Senegambian coasts to sugar plantations in Brazil, all the way to the great Mississippi. The Machand, August 1869, St. John's Parish, the Principality of Barbados, the windward states of the Antillean Empire. Eulalie was barefoot and angry, and it seemed to her that no matter how hard she tried, no, how, no matter how much she struggled to make it work, for some reason, she was getting nowhere with the business of being in Barbados. I beg you, you lately said with an exasperation. She squinted up at the few clouds in the, ra in the radiant sky with a pint of rum and in a hurry. And me now, Lord, be merciful. Eulalie did not like to think of herself as a temperamental woman. She'd tell you, all I is doing is making sense of a thing. If this question were brought up amongst town folks itself, you might obtain a fundamentally differing suggestion on the matter. She was the, you vex me like the devil vex Jesus woman. Eulalie would tell you that was no serious business. She would tell you it was only days like these, days when the sweat dripped down her chin just from standing, when the back of her neck pulsated with annoyance. It was these days that she found herself more than short-tempered and something beyond vexed. It is fair to say you lately was not in the, in the mood today. Not in the mood for any of it. If there was ever a day to be hanging by one last fibrous, constantly harangued nerve, it was not today. Because to add to it all, you lately was late. One was never late to the marketplace. And because she was late, she left her home without thinking too much further than her need to do right away or else business. She had gone and raced out, leaving behind her shoes. In all these years, she had not once made this mistake. In any other Mashan's case, they would have felt the pebbles and broken twigs of the brightly colored blooms that populated the high places and turned around. Yulele, however, had not felt the undersoles of her feet in a long, long time. Rather, it was not until she looked down at her feet just a mile away from her destination that she saw she was bootless. Notwithstanding the numerous issues Amasha, like herself, would encounter in the business of selling, there were two cardinal sins in the marketplace in Barbados. The first, and most general in any marketplace labor, led by Imperial Commission standards in the Windward Isles, was not to be late. The second, and more colloquially known, was not to be without style and upkeep, like we still in the days of bondage. It was an unwritten law, to be sure, but it was much said. Being without shoes definitively fell into the latter category. So, Eulalie was in a hurry, but she was also hesitant. 
for when she finally arrived, she would have to deal with a swarm of women regaled like lumps of sugar in colorful chapeaus, counting pieces of money like a bee counts honey. And each of these women would be pointing directly at her, calling out, How come your feet black as midnight, girl? Yes, you lately had black feet. Not negro feet. Not morena feet. Not cafe, no. The bottoms of her soles were black as the coals her old master made a walk on, and as unfeeling as his leather whip. Eulalie figured she must have burnt the soil and dirt into the flesh of her feet. Or maybe she was like one of them people in the white stories where their mamas dipped them in the rivers to make them strong as lions. In those stories, mamas would forget to dip their pinkies or their big toes. And those stories would end up in a mess of pain when an arrow pierced them or they bit into a poison apple. Sure, people tell those stories more than a few times. The people in those stories were always invincible. Eulalie's souls, however unfeeling, were not invincible. And more often than not, she figured the blackness of her feet a malignant souvenir. Like she never up and left that plantation on the edge of Pine Hill, South Carolina and round, ran southward with all her soul, past all the signs calling for a light-skinned negress with feet black like cast iron. It was like her soul poured out through her little burnt feet and her bodily strength was sapped by each crooked digit. Eulalie sucked her teeth. Now her damn feet had her recollecting again. She was dancing with them ghosts as her grandmama would say, when she would see some of the Negroes abandoning themselves to drink, holding freedom papers so fresh the ink had yet to dry. Nope, life didn't suddenly get better because you didn't have no hickory switches batting around your ankles no more. Just like her grandmama said, dancing with them ghosts, going in, oil, and wine. Only Eulalie did not have any oil and wine. So she took a swig of her rum, swallowed her pride alongside the heat, and picked up the pace. And though she didn't feel a single thing from her undersoles, little tendrils of memory rose from out her little mangled black appendages. It was all 23 of those long years on her grandmama's island, on her feet day after day till her knees felt like reef stones with a hot grill that gave a person more burn marks than a thief, a son that don't know any way to be other than boiling, and the fanaticism of people yelling about jerk chicken. Thank you very much. Eliana, how am I doing? All right. Um, will all of our readers please stand? You know, uh, one of you asked me, for a recommendation, like what do you recommend we do after this cohort year? What's the next phase? What do you recommend? Consistency, consistency, consistency. Um, continue to show up however best you can for yourself, for each other, for the work. And we all know that looks different, right? That looks different for each and every one of you. Life is gonna do what life is gonna do but continue to show up for each other. You know how to find each other if you need support. You know how to find me if you need support, all right? So let's continue to do this work together, all right? All right, 
once again for our fellows. And thank you all for giving us your Thursday evening. Cheers. Good night.